in public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and a world-renowned expert in grassroots organizing. Professor Hans entered Harvard College in the fall of 1960. In 1964, a year before graduating, he left to volunteer as a civil rights organizer in Mississippi. In 1965, he joined Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers. And over the next 16 years, he gained experience in union, community, issue, and political organizing, and became the director of organizing. During the 1980s, he worked with grassroots groups to develop effective organizing programs, designing innovative voter mobilization strategies for local, state, and national electoral campaigns. And in 1991, in order to deepen his intellectual understanding of his own work, he returned to Harvard College, and after a 28-year leave of absence, completed his undergraduate degree in history and government. <laughs> he was awarded an MPA by the Kennedy School in 1993, and completed his PhD in sociology in 2000. He teaches, researches, and writes on leadership, organization, and strategy in social movements, civic organizations, and politics. Professor Gans has been an inspiration to us at Doctors for America from our early days. His teachings and his example have informed our campaigns, our discussions, and our vision for the Doctors for America movement. It is a great honor to have him with us today. And we thank him not only for making time to be with us, but also for the extraordinary contribution he is making around the world to give millions of people a voice through the power of grassroots organizing. Please welcome Professor Marshall Gantz. Confronted us 
with the greatest threat to our democracy, a radical upward distribution of wealth that shifts not only economic, but political and social decision making as well into the hands of an ever rarefied elite. So now we grapple with another reality that mobilization to be effective must become organization. Mobilization must turn into organization if dearly won gains are to be sustained, built upon, and brought to fruition. Whether the challenge is climate change, economic justice, youth opportunities, health care, or quite simply, dignity, compassion, and justice in the way in which we live and work together. These goals can't be realized unless the responsibility and the ability, in a word, the power, to create positive change is shared widely, effectively, and equitably within our communities, our nation, and the world. So, one way to consider addressing this challenge is to consider the work of leadership, organizing, and action, which I've been asked to consider with you this evening. It's an approach suggested by three questions posed by a first century Jerusalem sage, Rabbi Hillel, in The Wisdom of the Fathers, in which he asks that we consider the following when considering what to do. The first question he urges us to consider, to ask is, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? Now this is not a, st this is not a statement about selfishness. This is a statement, uh, this is a question urging us to self-awareness, to understand our own resources, our values, our motivations, and our capacity. But the second question is, if I am for myself alone, what am I? Not who, but what? Because to be a who is to recognize that we exist in relationship with others in the world, and that our capacity to realize our objectives are, is inextricably interrelated with the capacity of others to realize theirs. And finally, he asks, if not now, when? That's not about jumping off a bridge. But it is about understanding that very often we can't begin to learn what we need to learn to act effectively until we act. And it's too easy to get stuck in what Jane Addams called the snare of preparation. Just another degree, just a little more research, just a little more this, just, and finally, I will have perfect knowledge and be ready to act. Forget it. Not how it works. So, the relationship of self, other, and action, who, why, why I am called, what we are called to do, and what we are called, what the world calls upon us to do, is one way to think about what leadership is about. Now, the fact these are questions and not answers is also important, because to enter into the domain of action is to enter into the world of uncertainty. And the world of uncertainty, because who can predict the future? Once we enter on a path of action, surprise comes, the unexpected comes, what we're not prepared for comes. And this is a challenge to the hands, in the sense of do we have the skills that we need to deal with these new challenges, and it's a challenge to the head, can I figure out how to use my resources in new ways to, to achieve my purposes? And it's a challenge to the heart. How can I find the courage, the hope, the sense of self-worth, in order to find the courage to act. So I define leadership as accepting responsibility for enabling others to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty, okay? Accepting responsibility for enabling others. This is not a diva view of leadership. This is, this is you know, the shining star that illuminates everyone with their brilliance. This is about leadership as a form of social interaction, of relational interaction with others to achieve shared purpose under conditions of uncertainty. This focuses on the adaptive dimension of leadership, not so much performing known tasks well, but learning to devise new tasks that are required. It's leadership from the perspective, not as a knower, but as a learner. Leadership from the perspective, not as a knower, but as a learner. Understood in this way, leadership is a practice, a kind of work we do, rather than a position we hold, or even a person that we are. So understanding leadership as a practice, organizing is a particular form of leadership that begins by asking not what is my issue, but who are my people? 
What urgent challenge do they face? And how can they combine the resources that they have to develop the power that they need to create the change that they want? People, power, and change. The significance of exercising leadership through organizing was highlighted by Alexis de Tocqueville when he uh, visited the U.S., the French aristocrat and scholar who visited the U.S. who people quote now like they used to quote the Bible uh, in, in the 1830s. And de Tocqueville, who was actually here to study prisons, I, it's a whole other story, but, but uh, he got very interested in American democracy. And, and one of the things he wrote was, he said, in a democracy, Knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all forms of knowledge. On it depends all others. That's a boy, that's quite a claim to me. In a democracy, knowledge of how to combine is the mother of all forms of knowledge. See, he was concerned about the problem of excessive individualism. And he saw American associations as a venue in which individuals could come together, discern common interests, aggregate their voices so they could be heard, and because they were voluntary, renew their commitment to share values. So from this perspective, organizing, organizers exercise leadership to, collate, to create the collective capacity that is just as fundamental to democracy as the protection of individual liberty. Collective capacity as well as individual liberty. Unlike caregivers who provide services to grateful clients, and unlike marketeers who sell commodities, candidates, or causes to paying customers, organizers develop the leadership to mobilize a constituency. You know, it's interesting word origins. The word client, anybody, there must be Latin scholars here, you know what, what client comes from? Anybody? No? Oh boy, I don't know about that. Well, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's called patience, all right, all right, all right. Uh, inclinare, which is the Latin word, it means to, to, to lean or to lean upon. So a client is one who leans upon. I mean, at least that's the origin. Constituency has a different origin, which means, uh, constar, comes from constare, which means to stand together. It is a community standing together. And that's what the work of organizers is to bring communities into relationship with one another so they can stand together to collaborate effectively on behalf of their common purposes. Now, organizing is not something new, uh, and it sure wasn't invented at the Kennedy School. Uh, that's for sure. um, I mean, the first organizer I heard of was this guy named Moses, who actually, uh, who I've always been interested in because he was a Jew who was an Egyptian. He was, he was of the oppressed, but raised in the house of the oppressor, and it was kind of confusing for him. He had to go to the desert and try to sort it all out, which is where you go in the Bible to sort things out. <laughs> but certainly, certainly, the idea of people joining together to free themselves from oppression and find new pathways forward uh, is, is, is deeply embedded in our faith traditions. Uh, it's certainly as old as the Greeks, uh, and, there, and when they discovered that they didn't need kings to govern themselves, but could actually govern themselves as limited as their democracy was. It was a different way of doing things. And, and it's certainly as old as people learning on their own how to use their resources in ways to, to protect themselves. One of the stories I like, anybody know where the word boycott comes from? Anybody out there? Everybody know what a boycott is? <laughs> Boycott's when everybody agrees with it. Well, it turns out that uh, there, there was this uh, British landlord in, uh, in Ireland uh, who had tenant farmers. And these tenant farmers, uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't making any, any, you know, fixing anything. The tenant farmers got together and they refused to pay rent to this British landlord. And eventually he gave in. And his name happened to be Captain Boycott. And so that's where we get Boycott. And of course, if you look at the early New England townships, you'll you'll see in every, at the center of every one, a church, a meeting house, and a commons. Reflecting those three threads that weave together in the ground for organizing as it's practiced in, as it's practiced in this country. Now, my own introduction to it came, as was said, in 1964 when I dropped, uh, when I uh, dropped out, you know, it's true, that's what I did, uh, <laughs> uh, after my uh, third year at Harvard uh, to volunteer for the Mississippi Summer Project, which is actually where I began my political education, and um, with all due respect to Harvard. Um, and it, it was, 
the reason, you know, as I thought back about why, uh, we had lived in, my, my father was a rabbi, my mother a teacher, and we had lived in Germany for three years after the Second World War when you know, he, he was a chaplain in the army and his work was mostly with Holocaust survivors. And as a child, people were coming through our home who had survived that horror and were on their way trying to find hope in some place. And my fifth birthday party was in a what was called a DP camp, displaced person camp that was all children which as a five-year-old I thought was really great, until later I came to understand that the parents had all been killed. But my parents interpreted the Holocaust to me not as a consequence simply of anti-Semitism, but of racism and that racism killed. Very simple, not complicated politics, not complicated moral questions. Racism kills, civil rights movement was fighting racism. Okay. Now second, as a rabbi's kid, you know, you have to go to everything. You have to go to all the, you know, celebrations and all that. And that has its benefits, but uh, it also has its costs. Uh, you're supposed to be perfect, you know, and everything. And, but I love the Passover Seder. Now, how many people have been to a Seder, a Passover Seder? Well, you know, it's, it's a celebration, a reenactment uh, of the Exodus story with food, right? And, and, uh, and there's a part where they point to the children and they say, you were slaves in Egypt. And I had a hard time figuring that out. I said, I've never been a slave, I've never been in Egypt, what are you talking about? <laughs> Until I came to understand that the point was that that story is not the property of one people, place, or time. But is actually told generation after generation, the world over. And of course the civil rights movement was telling that same story and the only question was, are you over there with Pharaoh or are you here with these people that are trying to free themselves? And the answer was kind of clear. And finally, it was a movement of young people. You know, Dr. King, when he led the bus boycott, Montgomery, Alabama, I don't know, anybody know how old he was? Out there? 34. 25, all right. Let me see, who's under, no, I won't ask here, but, uh, no, he was 25. Uh, the people leading the, the Freedom Rides and all that, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, these are young people. And, and it goes back to Brueggemann's idea. You know, young people come of age with a critical eye on the world they find, and almost of necessity, hopeful hearts. And that combination of a critical eye and a hopeful heart is what creates that, that, that passion for change. And it did in my generation, and I believe and I hope that it is doing so in this generation as well. And we should give a little applause for this generation. And what they're coming to. <laughs> well, when I went to Mississippi, that, as I say, that's kind of where my political education began, my understanding of organizing, because you could take almost any measure of well-being. Um, housing, healthcare, education, you name it, and whites were here and blacks were here. Um, but it was also very clear that bringing a few medical supplies or a few books wasn't going to change anything. It was make the person who brought them feel better. But it really wasn't going to deal with the problem. And that's when I began to learn the difference between charity and justice. And I came to understand that love that doesn't embrace power can never be just. Just as power that doesn't act with love can never be just. But it goes, the things come together. And so when you look underneath all those sources, all that inequality, you have to ask why. Where did it come from? What's it about? Well, African Americans didn't have the right to vote. No political power. Economically, con confined to marginal plantation agriculture, no unions. No economic power. And culturally, I never had the experience of going up to somebody twice my age who would stand up, offer me his chair, call me mister, not look me in the eye and introduce himself with his first name because he was black and I was white. And that kind of interaction between blacks and whites was thousands of times a day all across the South. And you put together the political and the economic and the cultural powerlessness and you say, okay, I get it. It's not that people don't want change, but they don't have the power to insist upon it. And there's other people over here who are benefiting from the way it is, and they're not going to let go. So the first lesson I got from that was you have to take power seriously. 
If you want to deal with inequality, you have to take power seriously. But then taking it seriously, what do you do about it? Well, we thought, some people thought, well, you, you look up for power. You, you go to where the power seems to be. Like you go to Washington and you ask for power. You say, hi, Washington, we have a little bit of your power to help us fix things down here in Mississippi. Well, generally speaking, it, you know, it was, well, these things take time and, you know, you can't change this in a day and, you know, I need to do a little more research and maybe you can testify before our, our committee here and you're very nice people and all that. And so what we learned was that unless the people with the problem could also become authors of the power to solve the problem, the, the solution would not be real. And it wouldn't even happen. It wouldn't even happen. Well, we have a problem. The, the, the people with the problem don't have any power. So how do you solve that? What we learned was that there's a difference between resources and power. And we learned that while many communities lack power, they're not all lacking in resources. And the challenge an organizer faces is how to turn, turn a community's resources into the power to create change. And the clearest example of that is the Montgomery Bus Boycott that began the modern civil rights movement in 1955. And you all know the story of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. I don't know that story. 1954, the Supreme Court says segregation is unconstitutional in schools. Leadership in Montgomery decides that it should apply to public transportation as well because the buses in Montgomery had blacks in the back, whites in the front, no man's land in the middle, in the middle, an armed deputized bus driver that anybody, any black person getting on the bus had to walk by, down the rows of white people, find a seat, and then give up their seat to a white person if they wanted it. Twice a day, to work, home. That's not some remote injustice. That's like injustice right in your face. And that's about the anger to create change. So people wanted to do something about the buses. Well, you know the story. One day a lady got tired and didn't get up. Her name Rosa Parks. Not so. There was a strategy. She was secretary of the NAACP chapter. She'd been trained in organizing. And they were looking for a litigant to file a suit to get the courts to order the city to integrate the buses. So Rosa got arrested, but then the women's committee at the college, led by a woman named Joanne Robinson, decided they needed to show solidarity with Rosa, and so they made up leaflets and went to Dr. King and said, can we pass out these leaflets? And the leaflets asked for everybody to stay off the buses, and they made announcements in all the churches, and the next day, everybody stayed off the buses. Now what happened was that people then discovered they had a resource that could add up to power. And it was a resource that they found not by looking up, but by looking down, way down. And that resource was their feet. If they used their feet, not to get on the bus, but to go to work, and if they all did it together, then that bus fare they'd be given to the bus company, which gave them no power, collectively withdrawn could give them a lot of power. And it revealed the interdependence that it's the root of power, of power relationships, as Gandhi always taught us. So that lesson really was what informed the birth of the modern civil rights movement. And the discovery that ordinary people have resources to make change if they learn how to combine those resources and use them effectively. Now that takes leadership, skilled leadership. It doesn't just happen, it doesn't just happen, you know, because of sunspots or something. And you know, Dr. King, uh, you know, he didn't come out of the womb knowing how to be a leader. Where do you, where do you think he learned his leadership? Where? Yeah, his father's a Baptist preacher, his grandfather's a Baptist preacher. In the Baptist church, if you don't organize your congregation, you're out of a job. So it's very good incentive. The same as rabbis, it kind of works, works the same way, so I have, have some insight into that. But the black church generally was a, was a leadership school, the boards of deacons and missionary societies equipping people for this struggle. The Prince Hall Masons, the black fraternal. And of course, the guy who actually thought out the boycott was a guy named E.B. Nixon, who was a member of A. Philip Randolph's sleeping car quarters union. He would leave my government, travel around the country and learn about organizing and go back and contribute to that. So what I learned from that was that, that there is a way to make change, and it, but it requires developing skilled leadership, building community around that leadership, 
and building power from the resources of that community. And to me, that then became my calling for the next 28 years. When I left the South and went back to California instead, uh, Cesar Chavez was just starting a great strike pretty much from where I grew up in, uh, in Delano. Uh, now, I had grown up in the middle of the farm worker world, but I'd never seen it. I had to go to Mississippi to get educated about race, power, and politics in America to go back home with what we call Mississippi Eyes and see another community of people of color had no civic rights to speak of, no economic rights excluded from federal labor legislation. And of course, California has its own rich history of racial segregation going back to the turn of the century with the Chinese. As late as the 50s, were desegregating movie theaters in LA that had Mexicans upstairs and whites downstairs. So it turned out that Mississippi was not an exception to America, but rather an example of the America that needed to change. And so I began working with Caesar and did that for the next 16 years, up until 1981. Did another 10 years of union issue and electoral work. And then, as was reported, in 1989, I got invited to my 25th reunion at Harvard. <laughs> so wait a second, I never graduated. What were you inviting me to a reunion? And then I realized, well, there was this dropout up in Seattle who made some money, and, and maybe, you know, I mean, who knows, you know? Well, that wasn't my story at all. But I came to that reunion, I was, you know, activists, we, we, we're so into the action that, that sometimes we stop, we forget to reflect, to learn, to think about what we're doing. And I went to that reunion, I ran into a 20-year-old version of me that was still there in the Harvard Yard. And the 20-year-old me said, how's he going? And I said, you know what, I'm feeling very stuck. Reagan's been president all this time. And, I don't know, you know, I, I need to find a way to go deeper and broader. And so 20-year-old me said, why don't you come back and finish that year that you left pending? And I thought, well, that's kind of silly. But I went to see one of the deans who, if he laughed at me, I was so fragile it would have been the end of it. But he turned out to be an Episcopal priest. And we talked for three hours, including the fact that tuition had changed a little bit in the intervening <laughs> period of time. And so in 1991, I came back, finished my senior year, wrote a senior thesis in history and government, graduated class of 64-92. And, and, and my 81-year-old mother got to, come, got to come and see her son finally become a college graduate, and he would now make something for himself. And, But uh, I went out to Kennedy School, got a master's, and then, as was told by, again, my PhD in sociology. But while I was working my PhD, I was asked to design a course on organizing the Kennedy School. And teaching then turned out to be a way that I could integrate my life experience with social science in a conversation with a rising generation. And for me, that is a real blessing for every day to go to class and realize that I'm having a conversation with the teacher. It is a real, real Now, one of the things that I've learned, and how are we doing on time here, by the way? Okay. Oh, everybody's getting their food, so that's cool. That's this I can take care of. <laughs> one of the things I've, I've learned with the opportunity to go back and reflect on those years of, of organizing was, was that I had come to think of organizing as a practice that was more about fixing bugs in the system than it was about redesigning features of the system. But I came to realize that, in fact, organizing was a central feature of the system in terms of what made it work. Crippled by fragmented public institutions, the result of a need to protect slavery in one part of the nation and foster freedom in another, a very limited majoritarian democracy, government has rarely been the source, the initiator of change in our history. On the other hand, the impulse for change has been there. And so how did Americans find the ways to make change? Well, the inspiration and the model came less from political parties than it did from the Great Awakening of the 1830s and the 1840s. A vast and major religious revival that swept the country, a movement of moral reform that created the Baptist and Methodist churches in this country, a movement committed to transforming not only the world, but people themselves, that aspired to, uh, to shape, to reshape the world in terms of a vision of how it ought to be. A movement that emerged from the, not sort of 
spontaneously, but through the efforts of purposeful actors to assert new public values in participants as well as in the world, enacted locally, but motivated nationally to create change. Now, the abolition movement came right out of that. And then the suffrage movement. And elements of the early labor movement. And the agrarian reform movement. And later the women's movement. And the civil rights movement. And the environmental movement. And so we created something called the social movement. <laughs> the, the, the organized social movement as a way to mobilize around a, a, moral, a morally motivated vision and impact on the political parties, and through the impact on the parties, affect public policy. And that unless we have had both hands working together, the clapping noise simply didn't happen. And of course, the civil rights, that's what it was all about. Yeah, there was Lyndon Johnson, but hey, there was a whole movement over there. And so it, it, there's a kind of a, a dance in our political history that goes on between those of us mobilizing to insist on change and those of us in positions to respond. But we can't expect a response without the initiative. And that's why movements like Doctors for America are so critically important, because the change inside will not happen without the demands coming from the outside. It never has, and it never will. I just want to, I know that you're going to be doing some skill work and so forth in the next couple of days, so I just want to mention a few of the core practices in creating this kind of a movement, in what it takes to build this kind of organization. Of course, you're back to the others who are well aware of this, that's what they've been doing. But I want to mention five practices. The first is that organizing requires building intentional relationships that become the foundation for mutual commit the mutual commitment needed to work together. Now, it may sound like, gee, talking about big cosmic movements, you're talking about relationships? What are you talking about? Well, as de Tocqueville observed, it was association between people, not simply aggregation of individuals, that can create a whole that's greater than the sum of its parts. Relationship building goes beyond delivering a message, extracting a contribution, or soliciting a vote. Relationships are based on an exchange of interests and resources. But for an exchange to turn into a relationship requires a choice, a real commitment, a commitment of time, effort, and yes, vulnerability. Now, see, the funny thing about organizing is the, thing, the skills required are things we do. I mean, we all form relationships. But there's a structure within them, and if we learn to understand the structure, then we can become more intentional and purposeful in how we do it. Now, the basic craft in organizing is a one-on-one -on -one meeting. How many people have ever done one-on-one -on -one meetings? Let me see. All right, well, good, we have some work to do. I, I hope there's some, you know, the one-on-one -on -one meeting is actually sitting with another person and learning something about them, and revealing enough about yourselves, yourself that you can begin to establish a relationship, a shared effort. It's not just extracting what they have to give you. That's, that's I'm sure you, you've been someplace where you just say, you, I just got networked. You know, <laughs> so I'm not talking about that. I, I'm talking about the, the process of mutual learning that creates the foundation for another kind of commitment upon which people can work. And this is especially true when it comes to the work of change because once a relationship is formed with one person, well, they have other people they're connected to, and all of a sudden you're in a whole social network, and you don't have to go over, over the social media to get at that. You get at social networks just through people. And as a matter of fact, in South Carolina, see, well, as a matter of fact, it's especially useful when you can't rely on existing institutions and you're trying to change them. In South Carolina in 2007, the established democratic institutions were supporting someone other than Obama. And so in the, in the campaign, we were confronted with how do we build an organization out of new people, with new people. And that was through one-on-one -on -one meetings and house meetings, 500 house meetings to be exact, attended by some 4,000 people, which then became a foundation 
for a mobilization that would deploy 15,000 election day volunteers, most of them active politically for the first time. So taking relationship building seriously, number one. Number two, organizing requires turning one's values into a source of action by learning to tell your story. The story of your community and the story of the challenge that community faces. We choose urg urgent action motivated not by grievances but by injustice or the threat of injustice and the hope that we can do something about it. We experience the urgency of injustice or anger and the promise of hope not as an argument but as a narrative. Because motivation is rooted in how we feel about things, our values. It is emotion that moves us to action, not argument. As St. Augustine wrote, it's one thing to know the good, that's fine, but it's loving the good that enables action upon it. Because we can identify empathetically with protagonists who access their emotional resources to face challenges for which they are not prepared in the stories of others, families, friends, faith traditions, those stories can teach us how to access our own emotional resources to face challenges for which we are not prepared. As protagonists in our own stories, these lessons become our lessons, understandings of who we are, where we are going and why. How can we learn to overcome our fear? How can we learn to overcome fear with hope? How can we find compassion to overcome our isolation? How can we find a sense of self-worth to overcome our self-doubts? Strategy can answer the question of how we can act to create change, but narrative answers the question of why we must act, a matter of the heart. Now let me say one thing about hope. I'm not talking about what some people call hokey hope. We think of it as critical hope, and I like the definition that Maimonides, uh, the 12th century uh, philosopher, scholar, uh, gave, gave to it. He said, hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. Let me say that again. The plausibility of the possible as opposed to the necessity of the probable. In other words, being a realist is to recognize that the world is not only a place of probability, it is also a place of possibility. David sometimes meets Goliath. A black man actually could be a pre elected president of the United States. Talk about an improbability. But it happened, didn't it? That's what hope's about. It's about a sense of the possible. And, and that's the kind of realism that it takes to act for change. But motivation, and this is third, must turn into purposeful action through strategizing. How to turn what we have our resources into what we need, the power, to get what we want, change. Organizing power is created by asking not only what the problem is and why, but who is responsible. Power, power is a relationship. It's not a thing. It's a relationship between need and resources. And here I'm going to try another one of these little things. If your need for my resources is greater than my need for your resources, who's got the power? If your need for my resources is greater than my need for your resources, who's got the power? Yeah. All right. Good. <laughs> and if it's reversed, then who's got the power? So if you join with others such that my need for your shared resources is greater than your need for mine, that gives you power over me. See how this works? It's a balance. It's an interdependence. It's not a mystery. If we find ourselves to be in equal need of each other's resources, then we can collaborate to create new capacity, power with one another, to achieve more than we could separately. Locating decision makers brings into focus targets for the mobilization of our resources and resources held by a constituency. And I, I just want to emphasize this just for a minute. What was significant about the bus boycott was that the agency rested in the feet of that community. 
not in some expert, not in some media gimmick, not in some commercial. It rested in people's feet. When uh, the American colonists were trying to free themselves from Britain up in Boston, the resource rested in a decision by Americans not to, you know what, not to drink tea. That's how we became a coffee drinking nation, right? Not to drink tea. In the former, is when we were struggling to, to find a source of power to take on the growers in California, it rested on getting millions of people around the country to do what? To not eat a grape. So there's something about the simplicity of tea or grape or Gandhi's case salt or that, that points to the significance of finding resources that everybody's got access to and building power from those resources because that's how power becomes more broadly distributed. And in the end, if you achieve change that way, you've not only made a change in policy, but you've done something about the basic power inequality that was responsible for the problem in the first place. And that's what organizing is about. Fourth, organizing outcomes must be clear, measurable, and specific. If progress is to be evaluated, accountability practice, and strategy adapted based on experience. Organizing is about very specific commitments. It's about very specific outcomes. I was told by Fred Ross in training me in organizing, if you can't count it, it didn't happen. In other words, it's about changing the world, and it either changes on the ground in some way you can measure, or it does not. And, and of course, in an election, it's about votes. But in any kind of organizing, you have to figure out how to turn it into that which you can actually observe. Otherwise, it's gesturing. And finally, structuring structure. This is the structuring authority to, de to develop leadership and structuring time to facilitate momentum can create the capacity to achieve the scale that's required to be successful. Change requires acting to scale. Political scientist E.E. E. Schatzschneider observed, elites always try to localize change. Because in any given community, the elite has an advantage. And insurgents that are always trying to create translocal connections, relationships, in order to create turf upon which they can find leverage and sources of power. But so, so the challenge in organizing effectively is to combine local action with national purpose and national strategy. And it's not about top down or bottom up, it's about parts in a whole. And it's about needing a vision of the whole. This requires commitment to cascaded or distributed leadership development that goes far beyond the stereotypical public personas who movements, with whom movements are often identified. But volunteer efforts, and not only volunteer efforts, often flounder due to a failure to develop reliable, consistent, and creative individual leaders. I don't know, do you think that's true? I mean, it's something we really struggle with. On the one hand, there's the alpha, who claims to have all the answers, complains that no one will help, and then burns out. Let me see if you've had any experience with that. Let me see if you've Come on, come on, be honest. Come on. The more committed we are to notions of expertise, the more we tend to think that we're the only ones who can do it right. And, and that's, the, that's the antithesis of the kind of leadership needed to build a movement. The kind of leadership to build a movement is leadership that focuses on developing the leadership capacity of others. On the other hand, the whole, there are those who, who reject the whole concept of leadership as somehow oppressive. Something that feminist scholar Joe Freeman called the tyranny of structurelessness. <laughs> Chaos. There's always structure, but it's underneath and not accountable. And this unreliability is one reason that campaigns began to rely on paid canvassers and all the rest of it. What we learned, and we learned this very clearly in the first Obama campaign, was that well-designed, interdependent, properly launched leadership teams offer a real alternative. There is a way to design interdependent leadership that is more motivational, more accountable, and more resourceful than the old image of the single leader who's got the answers to everything. And in fact, in Ohio, in the general election, 11,000 such local leadership teams were the foundation of that success. 
So I want to urge you to consider different ways of organizing leadership, ways that are inclusive and interdependent. Finally, change also requires acting in time. Stephen Jay Gould, the paleontologist, the late paleontologist, wrote in a book um, uh, called Time Zero about two different ideas of time. He said, there's time as a cycle, time as a cycle which is the rhythm of continuity, you know, the annual budget review, whatever it is. But he said, then there's time as an arrow. And that, he says, is the rhythm of change. It's intense, it's focused, it's limited. Now, we experience that as a campaign. And it's structured that way for a reason. Now, it's not just, my friend Tom Hayden once said, change is slow except when it's fast. And I think this is kind of what we're talking about. It's structured that way for a reason, because when you're making change, you do not begin with all the resources you will need in the end to make change. But you have to start. And so you have to start making a road by walking it. And so you start, you have a kickoff, and you build to a first peak. And that first peak is, now I've got enough volunteers. Now you're ready to go reach out to more people, to voters it might be. And then you reach a second peak. And then, of course, everybody rests a little bit right after that because it takes real effort to get over it. And then you get to a third peak, and then you reach a final peak, and you hope in an election that it coincides with election day. That hasn't always happened. Your big election campaigns have peaked after the election, before the election. That's not so good. But the point is that there is a rhythm to change that is different than the normal rhythm of continuity. And so the way you get to scale is by by developing a cascaded leadership structure coupled and, and put to work in campaigns of change that have specific goals, time, and outcomes. Okay, so let me conclude here with a little story. And this story, um, it's the story of David and Goliath. You know that story? You do? Okay, good, I don't have to tell, no. Uh, no, here's, here's the story. You know, the, 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 the Philistines and the Israelites are having at it around Gaza. That's something that's been going on for quite a while. And, and um, the Philistines have their powerful warriors named Goliath. And Goliath comes to the front line and he says, I'm Goliath, and uh, I challenge you to send your champion to face me. And if I beat him, you're ours, but if he beats me, we're yours. What do the Israelites do? They're all looking at their shoes, they're got to go clean their rooms, they, they, they're afraid. And it goes on day after day, and no one responds to this mocking challenge. And then one day, a guy named Jesse sends his youngest son, David, who's 14 years old, and a shepherd, not a warrior, to bring lunch to his brothers, who are warriors. And David arrives, and he's got lunch, and he gives lunch to his brothers, and he's up on a hill there. And then Goliath comes out, and Goliath starts doing his yomamas, or however you want to understand whatever it was that, 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 that Goliath was doing. And, and David listens to that, and he says, this is an outrage to, 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 to the ranks of the living God. It's an insult. And all his brothers say, shut up, kid. Don't make trouble. And he says, no, no, it's an injustice, I gotta, and he goes to the king, he says, King Saul, let me fight Goliath, and King Saul says, come on, you know, you're but a youth, you've been a warrior since his youth, you know, you, you don't have the experience, you haven't had the training, you know, you haven't been to medical school, well, whatever. <laughs> and David says, well, yeah, that's true, but I'm what you got. He says, well, you have a point, I'll let you fight Goliath in one condition, you gotta take my sword, my shield, and my helmet. Because you're gonna need these weapons to face this powerful warrior, and David takes them, and he puts them on. But when he gets them on, he can't move, they're too heavy. And that's when he looks at his feet and he notices five smooth stones at his feet. He says, wait a second, I'm a shepherd, not a warrior. As a shepherd, I knew how to protect my flock from the wolf and the bear, and it wasn't with a sword and a shield, it was with a stone and a sling. Hmm, maybe Goliath's just another wolf, just another bear. And he takes off the armor picks up the stones, puts them in his little pouch, goes to face Goliath. And how does Goliath react? Ha, ha, am I, am I a dog that you send a boy with a stick? Ha, in the middle of the third ha, stone in the forehead and a Goliath. Now, this is, this is not a story about nonviolence, okay? But it, but it is a story about strategy. 
What's the first thing that starts the action in this story? When does it really begin? When does it really begin? What does it really begin with? David's outrage. David's outrage. David, David doesn't set out to McKenzie for a feasibility study on defeating giants before he decides whether or not he can take this on. And how often do we wait to commit until we've got a, quote, feasible strategy? That has strategy backwards. Backwards. David commits, and that's what puts him on the spot to figure out the strategy he needs in order to take on that challenge. So it starts with injustice. And of course, then David goes to the king, and what happens there? The king says, you want to fight powerful forces? Well, you got to fight them with their, with their weapons, right? You've heard that. We all hear that. And David buys it until he realized, wait a second, this other guy, he knows how to use those weapons. I don't. So if I'm going to build a strategy, it's got to come from what? My own resources. My own strengths. My own strengths. And, and, and why is it that David's the only one who sees this? He's, he's the only one who's not a soldier there. He's a shepherd. He sees resources and opportunities others don't see. And then, of course, he goes to face Goliath. And what's Goliath's reaction? Well, Caesar Chavez used to say, power makes you stupid. And what, what, what he meant was that when you're used to relying on an overwhelming preponderance of political, military, or economic might, you stop thinking. And that's what creates the openings for, this, for the Davids of this world to compensate for resources they don't have with resourcefulness that they do have. So, I hope that we can find the faithfulness to our commitments, the creativity in our imagination, and the courage in our values to act. Thank you very much.